Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. So please let yourself sit comfortably and at ease and listen tonight and Listening to teachings is a meditation in itself, um, not because you're supposed to believe anything um, and there's no exam at the end. Although there is a lovely poem I've read that begins, in the evening you will be examined on love. Um, So there's a real exam for us. Uh, But instead you listen to see if what is spoken has any resonance in your heart to what you already know, to what you know to be true. And the rest of it can just let go by. And in the course of this year, over these 12 months, I've been doing a series of teachings on Buddha nature uh, and on the awakened heart and the awakened mind. And tonight is... um, a particular quality where we're kind of getting through the list. You know, the Buddha was a list maker. Um, The four foundations of mindfulness and the five skandhas and the six paramitas and the seven factors of enlightenment and and so forth. Um, Anyway, uh, and we talked in previous months about these qualities which are really inherent to the heart of generosity and integrity, of wisdom and patience, of renunciation. And um, next month it will be loving kindness. That will be a juicy one before Christmas and the holidays. Tonight it's a different quality and I think an important one given that we live, at least some of us, in hard times. Outwardly, inwardly. And so this is the quality called, in Sanskrit, called aditana, which means determination, dedication, commitment, resolve. And it is one of the qualities that come out of our loving awareness. It is inherent to the heart when we discover who we really are. I mean, who are we? How did you get born into this body and mind? Um, It is really mysterious. And then how do we live wisely, given the fact that we find ourselves in the human incarnation. Now, I'm also aware that this is the night before Halloween. One of my favorite memories from Monday night when we had our um, temporary buildings for 25 years in the meadow over there, those of you who are here, those modular trailers, was a Halloween night in the 1990s when we had the guest uh, visit of the monks from one of the, it might have been Gondon or Shartsi, Monastery Guto Tantric Choir, the guys who go, oh, and you get all those multivocal, you know, they chant this whole chord. Oh, I can't really quite do it. But anyway, so they came in and they were going to chant for us and the abbot put his forehead against mine. I guess it was some beautiful transmission or something like that. It was cool, actually. It was fun. Um, And... So they were going to chant for us, so it was lovely. And then I noted to them that it was Halloween, and the moon was almost full. And I talked a little bit about Halloween to these lamas, you know, and the costumes that people wear. And they said, oh, we have costumes. They were in a van. And they pulled out all these skeleton costumes. And we went out into the meadow over there, under the moonlight, and they did the skeleton dance of the death on ha- dead on Halloween. And I thought, okay, whoever's central casting, this is perfect, thank you. <laughs> you know. So Buddhist teaching is full of ghost stories. And when I lived in the monasteries in the forests of Thailand and, and places in Burma, um, there's not only lots of stories of ghosts, but there's a really palpable fear of ghosts and it's it's like it's part of everybody's daily experience in some way or other to be wary of or to try to propitiate or make sure the ghosts are happy or things like that 
And of course, being a young and rude Westerner at the monastery, I said, ghosts? Who believes in ghosts? You know, um, and I went and sat out in the charnel ground all night and say, okay, come on, bring it on, ghosts, whatever. And I didn't see anything. And they used to tease me about it. They said they saw your white skin and they ran away or something like that, <laughs> you know. Or maybe it was my big nose and they ran away, something like that. Um, but there were so many stories. And my teacher's teacher was this very famous monk in Laos, used to go around as Milarepa did in the areas where people were frightened by spirits. And there are all these stories of him going into caves and being confronted by this huge demon. And he looked at the demon and he said, you think you're powerful? You don't even know who you are. And the demon says, huh? He said, yeah, your power is really crude. You don't have any power over karma or dharma or anything important. It's just crude power. Do you want to know something? And the demon got interested. And he said, all right, I'll teach you. I'll teach you how to meditate and so forth. So this, there are all those kind of stories. Um, but I'll tell you a more modern ghost story just because they're true. <laughs> a good friend of mine who was a monk for a time in Burma became the director of one of the largest hospices in America. He worked with Ramdas for a long time, too. And one day, um, a family in the morning came to see him, uh, and they said, our father is close to dying. Their dad was in his mid-80s, um, but we have a dilemma. Um, his younger brother, who was 79, was killed in a car accident yesterday, and we don't know whether to tell him because he's very close to dying and it would upset him, what should we do? And so hospice director friend said, well, let's go and see how your dad's doing. And they walk in the room and he's lying there and he's, he's his last day or two, um, very weak and, hi, dad, and they pay attention to him and so forth. And then he raises his head and he says, don't you have something to tell me? And they said, what do you mean? He said, my brother died. They're shocked. They said, how do you know? He said, oh, I've been talking to him all night long. So who are we? Really, who are you? What do you think you are made of? Do you think you're this body made of whatever it is, hamburgers or kale or whatever your (laughs) diet is? I mean, come on, you know. There's something much more mysterious about life than we ordinarily touch. And I have this beautiful passage from Annie Dillard from Pilgrim at Tinker Creek written years ago where she says, the secret of seeing the pearl of great price, I would stagger barefoot across hundreds of deserts after any lunatic at all if he could help me to find it. But although the pearl may be found, it may not be sought. It always comes as a revelation, a gift, a surprise. And she says, and then you see what was ordinarily before your eyes, pulsing with light. It's filled with light. She says it's possible in deep space to sail on light, the light of the solar wind, particle or wave, it has a force. You rig a giant sail and you go. And the secret of seeing is to sail on solar wind, hone and spread your spirit till you yourself are a sail wedded, translucent, broadside to the merest puff, illuminated by the light. So we do live in this mystery, and things are glowing with life. And actually, anything that you look at doesn't quite exist that way. Your brain really creates it. The eyeball is always moving. You know, it's not, it's not like a camera that just gets an image. It's actually always fluctuating. And then the and the, the the colors that go on the retina and go up through the optic nerve to that, you know, part of the brain, the brain really constructs what you see. So what is it to be alive and who are we in this mystery? And if we take that as a kind of deep spiritual question, then this quality of aditana, of dedication or determination, becomes a question, to what are we dedicated? And if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it starts with security, food, clothing and shelter, social needs, and at the top is the spiritual needs. 
but it often can be reversed. So that when you look at Viktor Frankl coming out of the concentration camps, he said, we who live through the concentration camps can remember those who walk through the huts comforting others and giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they showed the greatest and truest reality of human spirit of all, the possibility to choose your spirit no matter what the circumstance. And you see it in his life, you see it in the life of people like Nelson Mandela um, or others who, in spite of not having, whether it's security or food or whatever, um, that the spirit is really what they lived from and for. That's what they were dedicated to. And so we begin to reflect in our own way in spiritual life, what are we dedicated to on our own values? And of course, there's a kind of conundrum Because a lot of spiritual teachings talk about non-attachment, which is a very good thing. Being attached and grasping doesn't make people happy. You may have noticed that when you get attached to your children being a certain way, for example. They don't necessarily want to be the way you want them to be. They want to be themselves. The same with your partners. You know, you may have noticed that as well. So, but how does dedication and determination Resolve, commitment, work with non-attachment. The game is somehow to remember your true nature, to remember that you are consciousness, that you are loving awareness. But as my dear friend Ramdas likes to put it, he says, remember your Buddha nature and your social security number. Right? <laughs> that there is actually multiple dimensions of our experience And if you only remember your social security number, you're in trouble, plus which it was stolen last week anyway, so you're in more trouble. Um, But if you also only think, oh, yeah, it's all light and holy, and don't drive on the right side of the street, you'll be in trouble. Um, Story from Robert Johnson, Jungian analyst, um, the author of He, She, We, all these little wonderful mythological books. He said, years ago when I was in rural India, Before it got modernized, I was quite sick with a high fever and great pain. The man at the hospital, they took me to a hospital, and the man at the hospital must have seen my apprehension because he tried to assure me that they were a very modern facility. We have a thermometer, the nurse reassured me. (laughs) I later found that they had one thermometer that they passed from patient to another, and in between they held it under the water faucet. My temperature reached 105. I had terrible diarrhea and cramps. Somehow, after 10 days, I survived. The bill was $28. While I was hospitalized, my new friend from the village where I had come to live, Shankar, came every evening to visit me and slept every night on the floor under my bed. Of all my experiences in India over the next 20 years, this was perhaps the most touching. Um... When I was sick, my friend slept near me so that I wouldn't be frightened or lonely or to see if I needed anything. Now, in America, if I get sick, I can't get anyone to stay with me for very long, not to speak of sleep under my bed. But here Shankar came and not only slept on the mat but tended me. And then one day he stood at the foot of the bed and said, Robert, I want to tell you a story about Baba and his friend. This friend got very sick, and Baba came and stood behind him and said, Only say the word, and I will go to die so you can live. Robert, for you, I am Baba. You only have to say the word, and I will die in our friendship so that you can be better. It was like one of those stories out of the Shaharazad and the Thousand and One Nights. At first, I was shocked by this. How can you hold that kind of an offer? But I had the presence of mind to say, thank you, Shankar, for this great gift. Please don't do anything rash now. I think I have enough vitality left in me that both of us continue to live. And I did. But I never forgot the depth of the tie and the profundity of the relationship implied by this generosity I had never seen or known before. And so here we are, these translucent beings through consciousness, but also tending one another in this human form. 
And so if it's not attachment, then what is it? It's dedication, it's love, it's connection. I talk about this when I do have done weddings for people. If you're attached to the way a person's supposed to be, you will eventually get in conflict. I need you to be this way and you need to do this for me. It doesn't run very well as a relationship. But if instead you are committed, committed to love, to care, to bless, to offer, foster your support to one another, not with expectations, but with a steadiness of heart, it changes everything. When people love us with a steadiness, when we love with a steadiness, it changes everything. Tony Merton, if you know what it means to be out in the middle of an ocean by yourself in the dark, scared, then it gives you a feel for what every other human being is going through. She's the first woman to row solo across the Atlantic Ocean. I rode an actual ocean. Other people have just as many obstacles to go through. So dedication, and what does it mean as human beings to be dedicated, and to what to be, become dedicated? Dedication is really an expression of the awakened heart that says this life that I experience, that this embodied life, has certain things that, 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 I, that I value that really matter. And rather than saying, I should be this way, this is what I care about. And of course, you learn it, or you can find this quality supported by your training in meditation. So Zen Master Suzuki Roshi writes, suppose your children are suffering from a hopeless disease. You don't know what to do. You can't lie in bed. Normally, the most comfortable place for you would be a warm, comfortable bed. You pace up and down, in and out, but this doesn't help. Actually, the best way to relieve your mental suffering is to sit in meditation, even in such a confused state of mind. If you have no experience of sitting in this kind of difficult situation, you're not yet a true meditation student. No other activity will appease your suffering. In a continuous practice, under a succession of agreeable and disagreeable situations, you will realize the marrow of meditation and acquire its true strength. And so it's not that one practices in order to have a particular experience, but rather to learn this capacity to be present for the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows that make up human life. Now I saw just uh, last night um, the film... Jane at the Raphael Theater about Jane Goodall. And if you haven't seen it, it's really quite marvelous. They found a um, 100 hours of film that was shot in the 1960s of her by her husband, who was a brilliant and celebrated filmmaker, that they thought had been lost for a long time and used this to make a film. So you see a lot of her going there to Gombe and beginning to try to watch what chimps were doing, and no one had ever done it in the wild before, at least not not Europeans, not white folks. I'm sure that there were African people who lived there who knew the lives of chimpanzees much better, but no scientists, no researchers prior. And the thing that you see in it was how long it took her to make a relationship with the chimps. There were no dating apps, you know, we couldn't swipe on it or anything. Um, and she had to trape through the rain and sit under the bushes and, the, and they would run away each time and she would just sit there and she did it again and again and again and again for months and months and months. She was asked, didn't you get frustrated? She said, I did. But Dr. Lewis Leakey, who hired her, um, found that she had a considerable quality of patience. She said, I just knew that if I stayed long enough and still enough at some point, we could start to relate. And they did. It's a beautiful account of this. Your capacity to be present is larger than you know because your awareness is larger than you know. It contains everything. You are spirit itself. You are consciousness born into this body. And you also carry within you in your DNA generations of ancestors who've survived everything. 
You are a survivor. It's there in you. Um, You have strength. You have courage. You have stamina. And even people who are weak and sick and so forth, when it comes down to it often, there's a kind of rousing of amazing strength that you can see. It's just there in you. And I think about my grandparents and great-grandparents who I knew. I knew several of my great-grandparents quite well um, because they lived to their 90s. And um, so I knew them into my 20s. And they'd come over on boats in the 1890s, you know, as teenagers. They left Russia or Ukraine or places where there have been pogroms and anti-Semitism and so forth. Left their families, came as teens, knew they would never go back. And they did that, you know. It's not like moving from Marin over to Berkeley or something like that, you know. I mean... There are generations of human beings who have survived and struggled and brought life to you in the form that you are. And you carry this in you. So this is part of what it means to awaken, to realize and recognize this. So I'm also aware of how many people have in our neighborhood been affected by the fires. How many people lost their homes or have people close to you lost homes and places in fire. I know you're here. Yeah, so many, dozens, and many, many, many more. Story, I was a reporter at the Sarasota newspaper um, in Florida, um, where as as a cub reporter, I spent a lot of time covering fires. Um, One day, I parked my car behind the police line. Reporters were supposed to stop at and walked around till I find a way into the wooded area where the woods were blazing. Helicopters flew overhead, the pilots swooping low to fill buckets with water from a pond and drop them onto the blaze. And we all know this from what's happened recently so much. With the fire sweeping across hundreds of acres, firefighters were focusing on directing the course of the fire rather than attempting to put it out and limiting injuries by instructing people still in their homes to evacuate. However, there was one woman, Mrs. Rosa, Rosa Garcia, whose house I happened to be standing beside, who simply refused to go. Her husband was at work, her children at school, and she stood in her yard with a hose in one hand and a kitchen broom in the other. Alone with the fire no more than a few yards away, she sprayed the back of her house and roof with water and clutched the broom in preparation to fight off any flames that came near. A moment later, the fire crossed the back line to her property, approached her house, and then jumped it because she had hosed it down. Because she had stayed, the flames did not catch on. Now, it's not to say everybody could have done that because there were those huge winds that you couldn't have. But in this story, you could. When she dropped off her kids at school that morning, when she said goodbye to her husband, she'd had no idea what she would do or what she would be capable of doing that day. From the outside, she looked like a completely ordinary woman home on a Wednesday afternoon doing her household chores until the kids returned. But on this day, she defied the authorities who told her to leave, stood in the line of a tremendous fire, stood her ground, armed with no more than a hose and a broom, and saved her home. I think of this woman often, not because she was a heroine on the order of Martin Luther King or Rachel Carlson, but because she was an ordinary person who was able to find remarkable strength in herself. And if she could do it, then doesn't that have a promise for all of us? So this is really what this quality is about, and somehow awakening to this. And, of course, we can learn it in certain ways in meditation. In the training I did in the monasteries, we would sit up all night, you know, and sit long sittings and not move and walk barefoot in the morning 10 miles to get our food and stuff like that. There were sort of endurance things and monks who made vows to not lie down for a year and things like that. Okay. You know, all these austerities live in caves and things like that. The, the, the stuff young men like to do, kind of test themselves, right? I mean, it is, you know, give me, is there anything tough to do around here, right? Now, of course, that's the hero's myth. Um, the myth for women is quite different, you know. 
Um, for example, I think about when my daughter was born and um, my ex-wife um, went into labor and her labor lasted uh, almost three days because the, 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 the contractions happened, but my daughter's head wasn't quite engaged, so there kept to be in contractions, but her cervix wouldn't dilate. We'd go to the hospital and they'd say, no, 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 go home. And three days and nights, it was like some monastic practice on steroids, basically, right? And Joseph Campbell wrote about it when he taught, wrote about the hero's journey. He said, mostly men's initiation um, uh, is to try to find out, for, to try to seek or discover for men what's quite natural for women. So just to understand that. Um, and whether it's giving birth or in the feminine giving birth to other things in the world, um, there's a whole different way of understanding that comes through having a female body. But even so, the gift underneath is to look to see who are we really. And I just came back from traveling in China for a few weeks with my beloved uh, Trudy, we taught in a 1,200-year-old Zen temple there, and the abbot, who was very open to modern forms of mindfulness teaching and Western psychology and trauma work, because there was an enormous amount of trauma in the community around the temple, um, and how that fit together with Buddhist psychology. So it was, it was actually very creative. But anyway, there we are in this 1,000-year-old temple, and giant temple, lots of buildings, and in this big Buddha hall there are um, pictures on the walls of the great ancestors. You know, Hui Nung, the sixth patriarch, and Matsu, it was his temple, all these great patriarchs, so to speak. And Trudy says at one point, she says, I'd like to teach a meditation that as far as I know has never been taught in the land of China in thousands of years, so please close your eyes. Everyone closes their eyes. And she say, I'd like you to now visualize, it was a visualization, that you enter this great and august Dharma Hall and you look on the walls and you see the pictures of all the ancestors and they're all women. The great, um, you know, Zen ancestors of thousands of years. Um, and then you look up in the front of the hall and you see the abbess, who's always a woman, um, over generations, surrounded by all of her um, chief disciples, also who are women, just because it's a bit easier to get enlightened in a woman's body. That's uh, so. But men also can be enlightened, and we've saved a place for you in the back of the room. Um, but also, we'd like to ask if you wouldn't mind helping in the kitchen afterward. <laughs> Um, and it will be helpful to you because then you will be able to make enough merit that perhaps in a future life you can be born in a woman's body. You know, the women in the room were all grinning like this, right? And the, the abbot actually appreciated it. He had a good sense of humor about it all. And more than that, he understood that there was something that needed to change. Um, but we live in a society that in a way wants to put us to sleep. Not in a way. I've um, read this many times. Um, the best adjusted person in a modern society is the person who's not dead and not alive. Just numb, a zombie. When you're dead, you're not able to work for the society. But if you're fully alive, you constantly say no to many of the unhealthy processes of the society the racism, the polluted environment, the nuclear threat, the arms race, drinking unsafe water, eating carcinogenic foods. Thus, it's in the interest of modern society to promote those things that take the edge off, keep us busy with our fixes, and keep us slightly numbed out and zombie-like. In this way, our modern consumer society itself functions as an addict. And you can hear it, you know, great dilemmas, maybe you should go shopping, right? Um, so there's this force that wants to put us to sleep in some way, and yet there's another possibility, and we all know it because it is who we are. And when we sit and walk, 
practice meditation, do loving kindness practice or compassion practice and so forth. The point in some way is to remember that who we are is spirit, that we have a possibility to choose our freedom in any given circumstance. But it has this odd kind of paradox because even though it's always here, it also flowers with our dedication. And so, um, just as rain bo- raindrops one by one fill the water jar, so with care and dedication, fill your life with goodness. And this is a verse from the Dhammapada of the Buddhist teachings that moment by moment or drop by drop, both you can awaken, but also somehow you begin to transform your body, your heart, your mind, your consciousness. Or otherwise, you live on automatic pilot. As Julia Child writes, in department stores, so much unnecessary kitchen equipment is bought indiscriminately by people who had just come in for men's underwear, right? (laughs) And so you can get kind of seduced by the culture that says this will make you happy. And what happens in deep meditation, for those I just finished teaching a retreat with Trudy and a whole group of wonderful teachers here at Spirit Rock, is that sometimes when you get very still, the mind becomes clear and luminous. The body can dissolve into light. You have experiences of profound stillness or vastness of mind. And then certain qualities in consciousness arise which are described in Buddhist psychology as the malleability and pliancy of consciousness. And what it means is that when you become really centered and, and stable, you can place your attention somewhere and it just stays. It's like a well-trained dog, sit, stay. <laughs> okay. It's a, you can turn your attention to a state or to a quality and even more interesting you can call up different qualities and the psyche or the whatever you want to call it, the storehouse consciousness will allow them to arise. And you might say in a very deep place, may this consciousness be filled with joy. And it's like a video game or something. The body and mind just gets filled with ecstatic joy. Okay, too much, dial it down. Um, And the possibilities of playing in the realms of consciousness, the yogic possibilities, are really kind of fantastic and wonderful. But, not but, and then, of course, there's the laundry, right? As you know from that book title, After the Ecstasy, the laundry. Um, Those remind you, they show you who you are, which is a being of consciousness. You are loving awareness born into this body, a being of light. But then, um, as you learn that, the next task is to remember it, to embody it. And you don't have to have those experiences because we've all had experiences in walking in the mountains or making love or listening to a magnificent piece of music or sitting at the bedside of someone who's dying in that mystery, or there when someone's being born, or taking sacred medicine, or um, a hundred other ways that open us. We know we're not just this body. And as we remember, and as we meditate to remember and reawaken, that becomes more the way that we rest and move through the world. And the beautiful thing is that it's never too late to awaken, to remember, never too late to start over. The man was my age, but looked many years older. He was an army vet. He was also homeless, cold, and hungry. I could see he'd tried to wash up before coming to the social service department to ask for help. His face and hands were clean, but his clothes were filthy. And though he claimed not to have had any alcohol that day, the smell of it seeped from his pores. I wanted to get him into rehab, and I asked if he was ready to come in off the streets. No, ma'am, he said. All I'd like is a few dollars and some bus tickets. If I can get sober enough, they'll let me into the shelter across town. The shelter had 50 beds, cots, really, 
the homeless were admitted at night and forced out at dawn to eat breakfast at a nearby charity. Fifty beds and nearly a thousand homeless in this small city alone. And that is really one of the shames of our culture, you know. It really is it's something for us to tend to. Winter here in Northern California can mean cold rain and mud, and even though this man and many like him slept under bridges to keep dry, the dampness penetrated everything. His clothes and the bedroll he'd placed on the floor smelled moldy. The pages of a book he carried were swollen. I asked him how many times he'd tried rehab. Two or three a long time ago, he said. Maybe it's time to try again, I explained. I'd had a client who'd gone through the program seven times before it took. Beside, I said, we're months away from warm weather. What else have you got going? I watched his face as he considered my offer. I thought I saw a flicker of hope in his eye, followed by a shadow of doubt. He'd tried before. It had been hard, impossibly hard. But so was living on the streets. Finally, he lifted his head and looked at me. I reached for the phone. Shall I? I asked. He barely nodded yes. An hour later, I handed him over to a recovering alcoholic, also a veteran, who would drive him to one of the best rehab facilities in the county. Come visit me when you graduate, I said as they left. I barely recognized the man when he came into my office six months later, so tall and handsome, smelling like the outdoors and holding a huge bouquet of flowers. So there's something about trusting, about seeing in each human being the dignity or the nobility, the possibility of awakening in every being, and that it's never too late to be, to remember. And when you do, when you act with dedication and when you support that in another being, um, Goethe wrote about it, he said, when he talked about daring to dream, he said, when you dream and when you act, <clears throat> his ancient phrase translated was, providence moves with you, which is a way of saying the divine or the mystery. When you turn your energy or your love or your de- dedication to something, somehow the universe knows it, that same universe that made you and makes everything. And Um, Or as Helen Keller says, um, security is mostly a superstition. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And so when you dare, when you direct yourself, when you're dedicated in some way, um, all kinds of surprising things happen with this. And your vision, your sense of the possibility of living in a freer way, of being awake, and the dedication are the key. Henry Moore, the great sculptor, writes, the secret of life is to have a task, a vision, something you devote your entire life to, and the most important thing is, it must be something you cannot possibly do. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So it's not so much, okay, you check the box off on your list, It's really something more magnificent and greater than that. And it's a willingness to turn the soil and the, you know, the compost of your life into something beautiful. So Alan Chadwick was a famous gardener um, and one of the fathers of the modern ecological movement who was a professor at the University of Santa Cruz. He gardened by growing soil to grow his plants And what he meant by soil was different than the Earth's surface. It meant a power in the universe that could be concentrated in gardening to capture cosmic magic. This was his kind of description of it. Chadwick grew soil and planted seeds based on the relationship that existed between the Earth, its moon, the sun, the other planets, the weather, the way doves in the area coo, mist in the trees, and everything you could imagine. When winter was very bleak, he'd sing about the energies under the surface of the earth. Underneath, the seeds are full of life. 
This very moment, the seeds are waking up. They're, they're pushing up to the sun. The doves are singing, coo, coo. So once Chadwick took a UC Santa Cruz class to a junkyard lot that was filled with rusted out cars, broken glass, chunks of cement, sand, and lots of abandoned trash. He asked the owner if his class could use the lot for an experiment to grow flowers and vegetables. The owner said, sure, but you are crazy. This soil is dead. The garden later became famous for its extraordinarily delicious vegetables and gorgeous flowers. They grew the soil and the plants followed. So having a vision, having a sense and a dedication to it, or as someone said, life shrinks and expands according to one's courage and dedication. That's how it works. And so in meditation, the same thing. You sit and some days it's boring. Some days it opens you to something beautiful and some days you're making lists and kind of checking them off in your mind even before you've started your day. That's fine or you're at the end of the day and you're doing reruns of your conversations and so forth. And some days it's much tougher than that. Some days it's beautiful. But the beautiful ones or the difficult ones, they're not really the point. This from Zen teacher Carl Fried Durkheim, he, he writes, the person who being really on the way falls upon hard times in the world will not as a consequence turn to that friend or those other friends who offer them refuge and support and comfort and encourage their old self to survive. Rather, they will seek out someone who will faithfully and inexorably help them to risk themselves so that they may endure the difficulty and pass courageously through it. Only to the extent that a person exposes themselves over and over again to annihilation can that which is indestructible be found within them. And in this daring lies dignity and the spirit of true awakening. And this is what you'll see, those of you who live in Santa Rosa and Napa Valley and you know, Sonoma and places from the fire, the fire seems to destroy everything. And yet out of it, also there is a spirit that grows. And I know it, you know, the store is open and said, what do you need? Come and take it. The neighbors come together and say, we have and you don't share it with us. And there's a community spirit that comes in the difficulty that somehow illuminates the spirit in the hearts of everyone. In spite of racism, tribalism, you know, environmental catastrophes, political divisiveness, all the kind of troubles that we see, the power of love and determination um, is that medicine, is that capacity that will, in the end, transform it that can and will. Nothing else really is, has, that, has that capacity. There are you know, terrible things that happen in the world based on um, people who are unafraid to kill, based on violence and, and, uh, and those who are willing to commit it. And the only force that is strong enough, that's powerful enough to meet that is the force of love. As Martin Luther King said, when his church died, we will meet your capacity to inflict suffering with our capacity to endure suffering, and we will not hate you. We will wear you down by our capacity to love. Because in the end, we are connected, no matter what those who are frightened and those who fight say. Um, We are connected. This is the truth. Now, traditionally, the kind of dedication to love or to care or to illumination, whatever your dedication might be, in Zen, it begins with a vow. Each time you do a sitting, sentient beings are numberless, I vow to save them all. Dharmas are infinite, I vow to master them. 
obstacles are endless, I vow to overcome them, these kind of vows, little vows. Um, or Shanti Deva's beautiful vows that I love to recite. The Dalai Lama says in the morning, when he wakes up, may I be a bridge, a boat, a raft, to help all cross the flood. May I be food for the hungry. May I be medicine for the sick. May I be a resting place for the weary. May I be a lamp to illuminate the path in the darkness. And may I do so as long as sun and moon and stars and galaxies exist until all beings are enlightened together. Amazing, beautiful, poetic vow. And what it speaks to is human spirit. What's possible for you to dedicate yourself to. And Napoleon said it at the end of his life. The thing that astonished me most, said Napoleon, is that the sword is always beaten by the spirit. It is always true. Here he was conquering all of Europe for a time anyway. That the sword is always beaten by the spirit. So to what do you dedicate that spirit in your life? To love well? To be awake? What is it? Set your heart on gold, says Rumi. Set your heart on something really beautiful. Who are you? And what can you do with this life? Now in Buddhist psychology, there is a... um, A lot of emphasis on the power of dedication and intention. Short-term intention means that as you go through your day, when you get into conflict or you have trouble making a decision or some struggle of some kind, take a pause, a mindful pause, a few breaths, And then simply ask yourself, what's my best intention? What's my highest intention? And very often, the whole tone of your conversation will change because there you are trying to be right and, you know, or get back at somebody or prove your point or whatever. And you pause for a moment, or it's in your email or your text before you send the little text thing. And you say, what's my highest intention? Oh, it's really to connect or to work this out or to find a way to love this person or listen or something beautiful. When you ask your heart, it usually answers that way. And then you reread the text and say, oh, I better change a few words there. And the whole tone changes. And when you press it, you get an entirely different response. Or in the conversation, the tone of your voice changes. You may not even say very much different, but it has the quality of respect or wanting to listen or or to learn or to be open. And in that simple moment of quieting yourself and asking, what am I dedicated to? What is my best intention? Everything gets transformed. And in the same way, there is long-term intention. And that's like those bodhisattva vows that I just talked about. Um, You know, which is really setting the intention of your heart, like setting the compass for the direction of where you will go. Um, This is from Wendell Berry, poet, farmer poet. He writes, So my friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the world. Work out of love for nothing. Love someone who doesn't deserve it. Invest in the millennium, plant sequoias, put your faith in the two inches of humus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Go with your love to the fields, lie down in the shade, rest your head. Plant sequoias, plant those things that you won't live to see, but that someone will. Plant a forest, do something that won't compute. And so long-term intention is really not about what you accomplish or what you get, 
but rather what you plant and how you move, what kind of graciousness you can move through this world and what it is that you offer to it. And then if you have a beautiful intention, make a beautiful vow or set your intention on those kind of things, then you lose an election, you start over again. You know, something doesn't work out. Einstein's dissertation was turned down as irrelevant and fanciful by his uh, physics department, right? And um, Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team. And in the first year, Coca-Cola sold 400 bottles, right? So sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. That is not the point. Because you will have praise and blame and gain and loss and pleasure and pain. Anybody not have that? Please raise your hand. You can have your $8 back or whatever it was. Right? <laughs> it's just how it is, right? So then what do we do with it is really the question. What do we make of this in some way? Dina Metzger, poet, writes, Give me everything mangled and bruised, and I will make a light of it to make you weep. And we will have rain and we will begin again. And it's a poem for Napa and Sonoma and Santa Rosa and for beings all over the world. Give me everything mangled and bruised and I will make a light of it to make you weep. And we will have rain and we will begin again. Because we do and we can. Now, one of the other things that's really important to say is that this capacity to start over or to to listen in the compass of the heart that's built in you, um, you can see it all around you, life wanting to renew itself. As Pablo Neruda said, you can pick all the flowers, but you can't stop the spring. Life wants to come back. And all you have to do is watch toddlers. I love toddlers. The, the drunken sailor stage where they're just learning to walk, They try one step and they fall and then maybe get two steps and they fall again on their diaper. They fall like a thousand times, right? What do they do? Get back up again, right? And then they start cruising and it's not like, you know, singles bar cruising. There's a different kind of cruising, but it's just hanging on the edges of things. Um, And basically people are worried, oh, my child is slow to walk or speak or get out of diapers. No kid that I know goes to high school in diapers. It doesn't happen, right? The children want to become independent and our spirit wants to become free. And I, I can hear my daughter's voice at two years old. However, she says, one of her frequent phrases was, me do myself, you know, me do it, me. You know, that little two-year-old voice saying, oh, I'm going to do it, but you put on my shoes, me do it. We want, there's some kind of, there's some kind of, native and natural opening to freedom that is part of your heart. And the passage I read so often from Thomas Merton to the young activist where he says, do not depend on the hope of results. You may have to face the fact that your work will be apparently worthless and even achieve no result at all, if not perhaps bring about its opposite. As you get used to this, you start more and more to concentrate not on the results, but on the value, the rightness, and the truth of the work itself. And there's something about dedication that's really setting the compass of the heart in a direction of awakening or love or remembering who you are, um, of embodying what matters to you in this world. And then there comes this beautiful trust, somehow. Like Pablo Neruda's poem, you can pick all the flowers, but you can't stop stop the spring. And I don't know, the world is in a lot of difficulty now, as we know, many ways. And yet at the same time, there's also less warfare than there's been in a lot of previous centuries, believe it or not. If you study it, there are a lot more resolutions of conflict that are happening not by war than used to be so. 
Very slow are we human beings, very, very slow, but we seem to be learning slowly. The moral arc of the universe may be long, but it bends toward justice, as we know. Sometimes it seems very, very long. But then here is Gandhi again saying, where are you, Gandhi? Come on. I know you're here. Ah, yes. When I despair, I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love has always won. There have been murderers and tyrants, and for a time they can seem invincible, but in the end they always fall. Think of it, always. And that's really the voice of a kind of truth about life that we can add our own heart to, our own love, our own trust to. So many stories, but I think enough stories for tonight. (laughs) Close your eyes for a few minutes and just reflect, not as a meditation. You don't have to get in a weird posture. You're weird enough as you are without adding to it. (laughs) But reflect on your own inner commitments or dedication, what matters to you. What have you set your own heart on? And if it's not so apparent, might Today be a good day to listen and reflect on what it would be. And what in your life best supports this dedication, this direction, you can know. You are free to choose. This is one of the great gifts of consciousness. You are loving awareness itself and you can choose. And this is a great gift. (laughs) 